This episode of Grilled is sponsored by Rationale, your leading provider in multifunctional hot food preparation equipment. Register now for a free Rationale live demo at www.rationale-online.com. Thanks for downloading Grilled by The Stuff Canteen. I'm Cara, editor of The Stuff Canteen, and in this episode, founder Mark Morris talks to Michelin-starred chef Daniel Clifford and his head chef at Midsummer House, Mark Abbott. They discuss what they've been doing with their time since the lockdown began and how different the restaurant will be when it reopens its doors. So, first of all, I'm going to ask you two gentlemen to start by introducing yourself. Daniel, do you want to go first, please? Yes, so I'm Daniel Clifford. I run a restaurant in Cambridge called Midsummer House. I've been here, for, well, we've, I've owned it for 22 years now. Mark? Um, I'm Mark Abbott. Um, I've worked at Midsummer now coming up in 10 years and uh, been head chef for five of them. Put your bloody phone down. Your mum's watching anyway. <laughs> right, um, I'm back Dan- on it. Daniel, <laughs> we're going we're gonna to talk about the future of Midsummer House, um, but I think... That- yeah. What we need to do is, is to start with, let's just talk, give us a, in, in a minute, your relationship with Midsummer House, when it all began, how long you've been there, a little bit about Midsummer House, and then we'll go into where Midsummer House is going. Well, I, the restaurant was opened in 98, August 98. It was opened when I was 25. Um, i would worked around England and France in one, two and three star restaurants. Um, I was working in Leeds prior to this in a restaurant called Raskas, which, which, which was a 140 cover restaurant, six chefs in the kitchen, six days a week, uh, proper graft. Uh, I got to a point where I felt that I was helping write the menus and running the kitchen and it was time to do something for myself. So um, my business partner and me decided that we were going to open this. And um, yeah, it was... Uh, I didn't have a clue, really. I think I, I opened it on the grit of my teeth of what I'd learned prior, but I didn't understand p ls I didn't understand laundry. I didn't understand wine. It was all a learning curve. I knew I could cook, uh, but, you know, it took five or six years, really, to get my own style and understand exactly where I was going. And it was all, it, it was built by hand because we didn't have any finances. So, you know, uh, down down the bottom of the garden we had to lay all the cement ourselves we had you know everything is, is and I, i'll be honest with you that 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 ethos of the restaurant hasn't really changed we still do 90 percent of everything we do you know at the moment me and mark we dress nicely at the moment but we've been knee deep in um sanding for the last five days because we decided to start sanding the stairs silly i don't know why we started that but it's starting to look really good but i think um you know, it's taken me 20 years to get confidence in understanding exactly where the restaurant was because the whole of my career, I was told that I wasn't good enough and that sort of stuck with me. And it's, I'll be honest with you, lots have changed. My, my, my feelings has changed. My belief in myself has changed. And, you know, it's, it's a family and it's always been a family. And if you've done time at Midsummer House, you know, you're still part of that, that history and that family. And I think what lockdown has done for me and Mark has given us time the first time we've ever had to sit back and think about it. And I think this interview is going to be interesting because first of all, he's upstairs and I'm here. And you'll, <laughs> very, you'll get a very honest opinion, but I think it's, um, it, it's, it's time to change things and the way the okay, industry has gone just, over. I've, just before you go into that, because I, I know that's what we're going to talk about. Mark, when does your relationship with Midsummer begin? Um, literally, well, I'll be here 10 years uh, in September. Yeah. Uh, so join joined Midsummer. Um, it's interesting because when I came for my trial at Midsummer, Chef wasn't in the kitchen. Which is why you got the job, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I was, um, I came, the head chef at the time was Scott Fricker and it was, Scott plus four others and Scott was on the meat fish and running the pass and I came in and he literally turned around to me and went right you're in sauce with me and he gave me a load of these recipes and he says right this is where this is this is where that is and it was just it was electric for there was literally four people pulling this food together um at the pace of just lightning um 
And it wasn't actually until they accepted the job and came down to Midsummer on this Saturday before I started. And I actually met a uh, chef outside in the garden. Um, and uh, yeah, that's where it really all started. What did everyone say to you about that? <laughs> no, let's not. <laughs> no, 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 you need to hear this. Um, well, at the time I was working up in Edinburgh at 21212. Um, and, you know, I talked to a few different people and they just said to me, you're absolutely off your head. You're mad. Um, and the funniest thing was, was when I was, um, I call me at Dean's, I remember opening up the caterer magazine and we we're, were talking about, it was when I went down to Fairleys and there was an advert for Midsummer in it. And the reason I remember it was Midsummer was because of um, the logo back then. I remember the, my boss, or my head chef then, Derek Cray, turned around to me and he pointed on it and he says, that would be the place that would make you or break you. And I never thought of anything else until there's one day we were looking through some of the old uh, stuff you've got upstairs in the office and it actually dawned on me that's where we were talking about. So it's just funny the way things happen. So let's jump forward then. It's It's beginning of March, everyone's really happy. We're all carrying on our day today. You know, mid midsummer is, is, is doing great. Um, you're, you're classified as a fine dining restaurant. Uh, and then suddenly we get this bloody virus and jump forward six, seven weeks and the world is a completely different place. Um, pretty the much the everyone- strangest thing is, The strangest thing is, is I had dinner on the Saturday night. The first time ever I had dinner in my own restaurant on the Saturday night prior to closing. And um, so obviously we are open Wednesday to Saturday, lunch and dinner. And uh, I'd said to Mark, cause I'd been in Jersey cooking for Will, Will Holland. And um, I phoned him up and I said, have we got any tables left on Saturday night? I really want to experience what the customers feel. Yeah. So I had dinner, um, went into the kitchen afterwards, very briefly with Mark. And I just said to him, Mark, that's the best meal I've ever had in the UK. Wow. And uh, I was taken back from it because in the kitchen, you see the food on one way. Yeah. And, 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 and the process, you know, things have changed here. Yeah? I'm not in the kitchen 24 hours a day. I'm here all the time, but I'm either in the development kitchen or I'm, I'm um, doing the things that need to be done. And Mark runs the kitchen now because, you know, he's a lot cooler than I am. He's a lot uh, more collective than I am. And, he does it, you know, he's younger than I am and he does a better job of running the kitchen than I do because I'm still fucking aggressive. But the, How the, difficult the, was it for you to make that adjustment, Daniel? Mark's the only one that's achieved it. Was it difficult for you to let go? Uh, yes, massively. But he, um, when the job came up, about six months before the job came up for the head chef's job, Mark, we'd been in London cooking together. And he said to me, and I said to him, you know, Mark, would you? And he said, no, I don't want the job. And I was like, quite taken back from that and quite disappointed, really, because he'd been with me such a long period of time. Yeah. And he is, he is a, um, he is a perfectionist and he is, he is very good at what he does. And uh, when the job came up, I said to him, Mark, are you interested? And he said, no, chef, I'm not going to run it this way. He said, uh, no, I don't, I, I don't want it. And I, and I asked him why. And he said, because... He said, you won't let go. And um, I said to him, no, no, I, I, I need to change, Mark, but you need to have some balls and you need to think. And then the thing is, is, since that day, he now will stand there and say, no, we can't put that dish on. We're not ready for it. The kitchen's not ready for it. We haven't got strength here. You know, give me a couple of weeks and we'll get that dish on. And I think the end of the day is having someone that would, he knows Midsummer House just as well as I do, but he knows the strengths of the staff and he knows what can be put into place where. And that's where the magic is really now is because the other days I design the dishes, we finish the dishes together and then he puts the process in place for the food to go onto the menu. And do you know, for me, the proudest point of that Saturday night eating in the restaurant was that I just had this absolutely amazing meal, gone away for the weekend, come in on the Wednesday, seen what had been said on the Monday and it was like Mother's Day on the Sunday coming up and we'd, we'd started to do the prep and the boys were downstairs and I just called a meeting and I just said look this, 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 we 
I feel like we're wasting our time today. I feel like, you know, we had six covers booked. The night before that, we had 40 people booked for that night. When we came in the next day, they've gone down to six. And I said wow. to Mark, we're prepping for nothing now. I said, there's no point doing this. And we sat down and we, we had a proper chat and we said, right, okay, we'll close, yeah? So told all the staff, sat them down, spoke to them. And then um, we sort of... Um, How did the staff react to that? Shocked. Shocked yeah, is uh, a lot of emotion. So no yeah. one, wasn't all it? Of, no one knew. Huh? We we didn't know what well, no to one. tell them, and they didn't know how to take it. Yeah, yeah. And we were, I think we were one of the first in the UK because we closed on the Wednesday, and then everyone started yeah. closing on the Thursday. And uh, the staff had basically, you know, chef, is this a bit prior? Is this a bit too too early? And <clears throat> the way I wanted to do it is, and the way I looked at it is, I had to control my costs. What was the point in spending all this money on food if we were going to throw it in the bin? So we closed down, got rid of the, uh, told the staff that they need to go. We, 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 we're we very lucky. We've got a staff house. So all the, all, the, all the European staff moved into the staff house and we made that rent free for them. And uh, they took the food home that we had left over and everyone went on their merry way. And then for the first week, it was like we were watching the news and I was, I was ringing Mark like twice, three times that week. And then we started a Zoom meeting, which um, we, we, we started to have these meetings over the, the three weeks. And I had a bit of personal stuff that I had to sort out as well, which was, you know, took, took over my concentration a little bit. And then on the third week, I sort of got itchy feet again. And I said to Mark, we need to meet up. Yeah, I said, we, we, we've got to meet at the restaurant and start planning for the reopening, not knowing that it was going to be this amount of time. And this is where we'd had time to reflect and we'd had time to really think about it. And, and, and we both were very honest with each other and said, this is what works at Midsummer House and this is what doesn't work at Midsummer House and why are we causing ourselves all this stress doing things that first of all are out of our control, but second of all, we're accepting second best when realistically all we want to do is produce the best food service that we can do in the UK. So, so realistically, it was time to really sit back and think. And this is where, this is where the theory of what we're gonna do moving forward has really come in because now everything is questioned and, and yeah. it's, it's such a relief. Mark, Mark, you speak, because I'm speaking too much. That's all right. Um, you know, Mark, uh, Mark just, just, from, just from your perspective then, so you've yeah. had all this time for headspace, which if yeah, nothing yeah. else, right, chef, chefs are normally time poor, okay? Hmm. So what, what we've got at the moment is chefs all over the UK have loads of time to think. Yeah. So you two as a team have obviously sat down and thought, so, so what then does the future look like? What's part of the thought process now for midsummer? Well, I think initially, you know, when you initially go into that, actually, you know, your first and second day, you're thinking to yourself, right, you know, it's the shock, isn't it? It's like, well, we're not at work, what are we doing? And it, if I'm being honest, it, you know, we were we were doing small plans and ideas were going around your heads for a couple of weeks, as chefs had said. But it wasn't until we actually went, right, we've got this time. How are we going to we're never going to get this sort of level of time again. And this yeah. is so important to make such a dramatic and pave the way for the future in what we want to do. Um, and, you know, chef around me one day and he went, right. What pisses you off the most? What do you say? How long have you got? And yeah, it was that <laughs> conversation. He says, "But why are we? Why are we? Why are we putting up with that? Why so what, are what are some of those things? You know, what 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 was on that list? Um, for example, yeah. we feel we never have um, you know time to think. Yeah, was was a prime example. Um, you know. It's, it's silly things is, you know, we all complain about the staff, you know, every single kitchen you go into, it's the same. And we were like, well, actually, the staff are the staff. Um, we obviously, you know, we're very fortunate. Um, I've got a, a, a cracking core team in the kitchen, which I haven't had this level in about oh, a good three to four years. So, you know, I've, I've got a really cracking core 
Um, and the majority of them has been there a year, nearly pushing two years now. Yeah. Which I'm really proud to say. And, you know, we were talking about all that. And it was, it's a case of passing the responsibility onto the staff again and not absorbing you know it's it's not the case of being their 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 mothers and their fathers they're coming to work for us and we want um to be able to produce the experience and every single member of staff that we employ have to make a difference i felt for a long time that we were being interviewed ourselves so when you'd interview a member of staff they weren't in, you weren't interviewing them they were interviewing you and i think what i've said to mark from the start of this is this is this is this has been my home for 20 years and, and and i've i've nurtured it and loved it and i know this place inside out i can fix the stove i can fix the plumbing i can fix the electrics i know it the, the, the thing is is the things that have annoyed me is you look at the journey of certain ingredients that come into my establishment and you look at just the scallops they go into the fridge then they get because midsummer's got four kitchens because it's a it's a it's a two bedroom villa built built on uh, the common in cambridge and the thing is it's never designed to be a restaurant so we've had to extend this bit we've got more staffs we've extended that bit and the thing is is we've never had time to think about the journey of every ingredient coming in how it's prepared and when you sit back you look at it and you say to yourself that's three quarters of an hour extra time that we're doing transporting the scallops from here to there, moving it from the fridge, prepping it, taking the shells down the garden. And all you see all day long is chefs going up and down the garden. So we've looked at that. We've looked at the process of the like sommeliers. I'll give you an example. You know, I've had probably eight or nine sommeliers working for me over the time. They all come in, they all learn have their favorite wines that they buy from their favorite suppliers. And you give them the credit because they've got the experience and they love wine, but you've got, I've got quarter of a million pounds sitting in my wine cellar of wine that previous sommeliers have bought. And the new sommelier comes in and they have their suppliers and the wines that they love, but they don't love your quarter of a million pounds that's sitting in your cellar. They love the wines that they want to go and buy and they can sell to the customer because at the end of the day, they're the wines that they know. So you feel to yourself is your cellar is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Your outlay is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And you've got things sitting in there that's never going to sell. So that was, you know, me and Mark are chefs. We're not, we're not, um, we're not wine connoisseurs, yeah. but we know what we like. And Mark, for someone to go to, the cellar, when, they, when you work on the floor here, if you're the wine waiter, you take the order and then you have to take a five minute detour out of the, out the restaurant, down the garden, open two doors, get the bottle of wine, come back up. So my sommelier is up and down the garden for about an hour and a half in service, which means they're not on the floor, which means the customer's not getting the attention, which means we're employing more staff to give the customer the attention. And we've looked at every single journey of every single thing that comes into the, the linen, the, the lighting, the gas, why the restaurant runs. And I think it's really opened up a can of worms where we say to ourselves, what are we? Yes, we're a two Michelin starred restaurant in Cambridge. Yes, we're very proud of that. What do we want to achieve? We want to be up there with, 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 you know, I'd like, I'd like to die a three-star chef if you want the honest truth. And that's always been my ambition, but it's not the, it's not going to be the thing that's going to, I'm not going to put a gun to my head to say that I have to achieve that because for years I've been asking myself the question, we got two stars in 2005. It's now 2020. 20. We've had two stars for 15 years. I've refurbished three times. I've changed the kitchen twice. The food has definitely gone up a level. What, what are we missing? Well, we're not missing anything. It's what we're doing. We're doing too much. That's the question. Instead of saying, oh, we need to do this extra or we need to do that extra, what I'm doing now is I'm looking at it and saying, well, do I need to offer 15 gins? Not a chance. Because at the end of the day, is when a waiter goes to the table, 
that's a good five minutes just explaining to one customer what gins we have. And then if they don't even want a gin and the next person wants something different, just to take a drinks order could be a 10 minute situation before the customer's even got a drink in their hand. Now, what the way I look at it is hospitality, especially when you're coming to an establishment like Midsummer House, is you're coming to my home. Now, if you come to my home for dinner tonight, I wouldn't offer you 15 gins. I'd give you one straight drink and I'd say to you, that's the best champagne I know. So I'd pour you that and you'd be a happy man. So what are we referring to? I think the attitude that me and Mark have got is midsummer is going to become our home. We love it like our home already. We spend more hours here than we do at home. And I think the team needs to become a family. We need to work together and we need to understand the journey that the customer's coming on. Now, We've talked about vegans, we've talked about vegetarians, we've talked about the offer choice that we're going to offer. We're, we're constantly having arguments about that because are we alienating people from our business? But this is a time where you really do need to look at costs and you need to look at where, where the, the money's being spent because the situation is there's not going to be a lot of money coming in. And my, you know, my payroll is 80 grand a month, yeah? Now, that's a lot of money for a full yeah. color restaurant. Yeah. And, uh, you know, wh why do I have four kitchen pours for four days a week? Because we create a lot of washing up. But why do we create a lot of washing up? Because I'm a creature of habit and I still cook the way that I was taught 20 years ago. And the situation is, is technique has changed. The attitude for food has changed. Less is definitely more now. So we've got to look at everything in an aspect of if that dish is too complex for a junior member of staff to do, why am I making it harder? Because that's always been my problem is I've created something that nothing, no one else in the country can do, but not, I'd say nine out of my 11 chefs probably can't do it. So the responsibility gets passed to Mark and you see Mark doing all these technical things in the kitchen when realistically he should be running the kitchen and managing the kitchen because people should better do it and that's the outlook that we're looking at now is you know i'm scrapping my wine list yeah i'm selling oh. all my wine because i don't think we need a wine list because i think the other day is if i'm going to cook 11 perfect dishes i'm going to have 11 perfect wines to go with them dishes that blow people away because i want every course to be like having an orgasm that's exactly <laughs> how I want. And that's, that is exactly the, the mindset that we're setting out now is when you sit down, we're going to include the champagne in the price. So when the customer sits down, without even they waiting, want they want for nothing. They get the best service in the world because that's, you know, to serve Krug as, a, as your, as your um, house champagne when you sit down, people already know where they are. They know what the experience they're getting. And it's that they relax. It's not that car salesman. When you walk in the door, the first thing they do is they come over to you. Do you need any help, mate? No, we all want to say fuck off. Sorry about that. But at the end of the day, we don't. We're polite and we say, no, mate, I'm just browsing. I'll come and see you in a minute. I don't want that attitude in my restaurant anymore. I want people to sit down and let us blow them away. Let, let us give them an experience that they're never going to forget. I don't want them being questioned through the mill. Do they want this or do they want that? I want them to sit back, a bit like going to the theatre. The, the curtain curtains open, the show starts, and the experience doesn't end. You know, it shouldn't even end when they say goodbye because it's I'm like looking at the reservations. Like one of the... the the biggest problem we have is controlling the times that the staff, uh, the, the customers arrive. Because if someone books in at seven, someone's booked in at quarter past seven and someone's booked at eight o'clock, if they all turn up at the same time, that causes chaos in my business. Because, you know, to take a, take a jacket off a customer at Midsummer House, the waiters have to walk up four flights of stairs to hang their jackets up, yeah? Now, if someone else arrives at the same time, that's two waiters upstairs. That means the customers sitting in the restaurant aren't getting the attention 
that we're trying to give them. And what we've always done is, yep, get another member of staff, get another member of staff. But the problem is Not your payroll ends up going up and up and up and up and up. And it's all because you can't control what time people come. Yeah. So I've decided I'm, I'm locking my front door now. I'm not going to leave it open. We're, we're going to have an intercom system and we're going to have an entrance where you're going to get greeted properly. You're going to get a, a proper welcome to Midsummer House and it will be individual tables coming in and it will be, you'll be treated like a god when you walk in the door because the way it's run for the last 20 years is if 10 tables turn up at up or seven, we've accepted that, but we can't cope with it. And the pressure I put on the staff by letting that happen completely spins them out. Like 19, 20 year old lad on the larder trying, trying to sort out 40 plates of food to the spec that he wants. When realistically you see him, he's in the corner like a shitting dog. My staff shouldn't be in that situation. They should, you know, they're artists. They should, they should be standing there loving everything they do. And I think the end of the day is that's the point. I've said to Mark, you know, it's difficult because Saturday lunch normally finishes about six o'clock. The customers leave the restaurant at six o'clock. The so first customers are arriving at half past six. So the staff don't, they get fed, but they're sort of eating it while they're setting up the restaurant in Ireland. Yeah. It's, it's just not right. right. It's not, it's not humane anymore. We need to, we need to have a life. What lockdown has shown me, you know, me and Mark, we're standing the stairs, but we sit down and have lunch together every day. Yeah. And, you know, it's either him or me or, or we've got one other lad here. One of us cooks and we sit down and have a proper meal. And I've said to Mark, if we can't eat properly as a team, how do you expect us to work together? And this is, this is really the attitude that I've accepted now is, you know what? The customers are going to be out the door by five o'clock. The restaurant will be set up by half past five. And we are going to sit down as a family from half past five to quarter past six and discuss the day and discuss the lunch service and discuss what went right and what went wrong. Because every member of staff that works here, their voice needs to be heard because they are the future. And, you know, look at Mark. He's been here 10 years. And he's now a shareholder in the business. And, and I think personally, less is more for us at the present moment in time. So is that, is that you know, midsummer is midsummer and that's part of the attraction of going to midsummer. You know, you can't change it. It can't become this purpose built no. clin clinical. It's a house in a field, Mark. It's a beautiful house. No, absolutely. House but that's what makes it beautiful, right? Yeah. You've got yeah, clouds but... outside, you've got the river, you know. Wait, so many people walk past it, they don't think it's a restaurant, they just think it's a house with flip me, they've got big conservatory. Yeah. So for you, so for you then, Mark, what what it what is it, you know, in terms of the food, how are you you're gonna take away the wine choice, the wine menu? What are you gonna do with the food then? How how is that how are you gonna sort of take away that choice element? And you know, I know Daniel, you, you know, you were saying you went to Francine and that's been an influence on you. So where is the food gonna go going forward? Well, I think like, just taking one aspect off it, obviously we're looking at other, absolutely everything, but, you know, one aspect was we've done the chocolate box for, for, I think, from chefs being at Midsummer House. And, you know, we cater for dairy freeze in there. We've got ch chocolates with no egg. We've got so, like, you know, every everything, you know, we've got chocolates that are just chocolates for vegans. <clears throat> and you look at that and you say to yourself, and, uh, you know that is a job that is a member of staff who's doing that every day for at least two to three hours so you take over that a week that's some you know that is more or less a full day dedicated to doing chocolates and because we're stretching yourself so far you know you can't you can't get it one it it it, it chocolates to the level of which you can too and that's why we've made the broad, um, you know, the, the decision to, to scrap the box. And, you know, we have um, we've looked at two different ones. One's a chocolate, one's not a chocolate. And we want to have the confidence of serving the very best coffee we can get or the very best infusion we can get. Serve that with these uh, petty forces such. And that is what we do. 
and, and it's the same as the champagne trolley. We're getting, you know, we're not doing that. As Chef said he wants to offer you the best champagne he can get, and that's what we offer. Um, and almost with I doing say that, couple, Mark, I would say at the end of the day is, is when you come to Midsummer House, this is what you get. It's it's a unique experience. It's not an experience that that anyone exactly, else yeah. uh, is giving. And I think it is time to be bold and it is time to stick your chest out slightly and be proud. Because the one thing is, as I said, when we first started this, it's taken me 20 years to be proud of what we do. I sit in the restaurant on a Saturday night and I have the best meal of my life in the UK and the next day we close. So realistically, the food aspect, I don't think has ever been better. What so we need to do is... <coughs> we just need to refine it that little bit more. But are you, are you sort of, are you effectively saying then, sorry, are you, are you effectively saying that when someone now arrives to Midsummer, it will be a no choice menu and a match wine with that menu and that, and that's what you get. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. What I'm saying is you've selected the best scholar and with that you're serving the best Chablis or whatever it is you're serving. Is that kind of what the direction you're going in? That's, that is the direction we're going in. Okay. It's As well, one thing we are wanting to do is doing a non-alcoholic flight as well. Okay. So that's going yeah. to be coming from the kitchen. And the reason that is, is for me, I want to be able to, you know, for example, as you're very well aware of, for us to put a duck sauce, it gets probably checked by different staff, myself, mm -hmm. chef at the end. It'll get checked when it's made. It'll get checked before it goes on the plate. It'll get checked when it's, you know, refreshed and so on and so on. But I want that same detail and you know, the, the, the flavours, the flavours and the base of the flavours to be in the, the unalcoholic pairing as well. And, I, you know, I think with that coming from the kitchen and obviously bringing in the front as well um, through, through making different processes and what we're maybe thinking of is taking one of them into the kitchen for a day, you know, every, you know, and, and they're going to be helping to, to, pre um, to prepare that. But, you know, it's just what Chef said is, is you know, we that's what we want to be serving and we don't want to be veering off that. Well, so I think do you we'll, see... I think we want to cut out the middlemen, Mark. Yeah, okay. And the, that, what, what that, you know, it's very interesting that a lot of suppliers now are contacting us and I've got to cut out the middleman of or, or, or who's making the money out of this for the simple reason is I, I've got to use the best ingredients, but I've got to go to source for it. I don't know if, if I'm buying my wine, I'm going to go direct. So I'm going direct to Krug. I'm not, I'm not going to buy it from a middleman because at the end of the day is I need to be able to afford to offer that to my guest without putting prices that are absolutely through the roof. And I've, I've worked out if I buy in bulk and I'm not, I haven't got, I've got 125 champagnes on my fucking wine list at the moment. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. Madness. I'm never going to sell them. Yeah. That's just basically extension of my underpants. The situation is what needs to change is so by that you mean chef vanity right yeah yeah definitely but that was that's what that's what i grew up with i grew up with working in restaurants where their wine list was massive their, the, the attitude was you know luxury 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 but properly you know what is luxury luxury is a beautiful glass of champagne the best scallop the best beef the best pigeon the best chocolate we know what's the best because we spent. I've spent thirty five years learning what the best is. Yeah, yeah, days. I've got to, now. I've got to break away from uh, filling gaps on my menus because we're spending money elsewhere. And we've got to say to ourselves, right, this is the time now where we serve the best of the best. We buy it direct. <clears throat> we're getting a cheaper price. We can then offer that to our guest as a. a, a, a an experience, but an experience that they can afford as well. And the end of the day is, is it's a full package. You're coming to my house for dinner and I'm going to cook for you. And that, that is really my outlook because, you know, it is midsummer house. It is a house. It should be treated like that. And the end of the day is, if, if you come to my house for dinner tonight, I'm not going to offer you 15 different gins, am I? I'm not coming for dinner then. No, well, <laughs> <laughs> No, but look ser seriously. What, what you know? Do you, do you, what do you think the guides will do to this, Daniel? What do you think their reaction will be? I mean, look to me. To, my, okay. to, 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 to me, personally, 
I think the guides are going to be absolutely blown away for the simple reason is, I, is am I doing this for a guidebook or am I doing this because I want to be happy? Because there's nothing worse than being in your own, own establishment where you're walking around unhappy and you're unhappy because you're doing things that you really shouldn't be doing, but you're doing it because just in case this happens or just yeah. in case that happens. Yeah. Why, am, why, why am I... I'm, I'm trying to please everybody, but I'm not pleasing myself. Yeah. Now, the end of the day is, it is time for the fear to be lost from Midsummer House and the, the smiles to be on my staff. As I've said to, to, to Nicole, who runs the front for me, do we need waiters that have worked in one, two and three star restaurants or do we need personality? Because realistically, personality sells everything to me, yeah. a smile and someone who's genuine. You think about it, a waiter that needs to understand 11 different glasses of wine and 11 different dishes, they can learn that and they, they, they can be extremely knowledgeable about that. Yeah, they, can't be knowledgeable about, they can't be knowledgeable about a wine list for 650. So you're always going to have that awkward moment at the table. Yeah. What I'm trying to do is remove the awkwardness for the customer. So the customer feels like king. But my staff, they got so much confidence because... They know what they're doing. They believe in what they're doing. They've tasted what they're doing and they love it just as much as me because nothing's going to go on the menu unless everyone's tasted it and everyone believes in it because the end of the day is self-belief is the only thing we've really got right now because no one knows the future. And I guess, Mark, that kind of comes back full circle, doesn't it? What you said earlier about not having enough time to think. Yeah. If you haven't got staff doing all of the chocolates, doing, you know, scallops and having to run all over the place and that has to free up time that time therefore i guess can be used in focusing their attention solely on you know daniel mentioned the guy in the larder doing 40 dishes that isn't going to happen is it you're going to have much more time to focus on doing your dish and there's an argument there to say your product should improve well that's it it's you know it's funny because um we, we did a meeting there with all the lads and I said to them, I said, right, every single section, I want the list of actually what's on our menu. And then I want a list of what we do, additions and allergies. Yeah. The allergies and addition list was actually bigger than the menu list. But you're not going to get away from that, are you? How are you going to get around that? You're always going to get, you know, dairy free. <laughs> At the yeah. moment, at the moment, if I'm being honest, moment, the conversation is, I want to scrap it all. He wants to keep some of it. Look, if you if you want to go to Inisha with Gareth, he, he won't take you if you've got an allergy. You know, there you it, go. It, it depends how you do it, right? I mean, it's your house. Think, you you could say, I'm really sorry. That's a business decision, but at, at some point, you are going to get that. You're going to get gluten, dairy. You know, well, you you the, are going to get allergens. The thing is, is you know, our online reservation is online. It, it's, it, it's, you know, you're not talking to anybody. So everything's done online. At the end of the day is, I think, is if it's clear from the outset, it's very, very black and white what we do. We're proud of what we do. And at the end of the day is, is what Chef constantly says to me. And he says, you know, you don't go to a concert and expect another artist to be playing. Yeah, it's fair. It's a fair comment. So you you're coming. You you're coming you to Midsummer House Theatre. You're not coming to down the road. On, What's that, Chef? I said you don't walk into Rolex and ask them to make it like a Brightlin, do you? No. So realistically, it's... you know, there's lo lots of other restaurants off with lots of different offers. I. Uh, this is a unique experience. You're coming here to be blown away. This should be a, a special occasion. You should come here and feel like you're the king of the castle. Now, the end of the day is that's the experience that I want to offer. I can't achieve that if I'm offering, offering everything to everyone because that's what I've tried to do. This, we just need to remember the golden saying, what Michelin have always said. They can only judge you on what they give them. Yeah. So the end of the day is if the choice is limited, they can only judge me on that. Yeah. So realistically, it's a no-brainer in my head. So to wrap this up then, 
we we get rid of the virus, you know, vaccine, whatever. Uh, we 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 go back to normal, whatever normal is. Um, are you from day, is is this from day one of midsummer opening post the virus? This is the direction of midsummer now, is it? It's it's yeah. It's it's you know tasting menu only, no choice, matched wine flight. You know it goes without saying you'll use the best ingredients and the best wine, but from day one, that's now the direction of midsummer. Uh, I've I've got everyone working. Um, everyone's mindset, even the, the staff that aren't here are at home working on uh, writing out lists of how the ovens get used, uh, how, how, how we reduce waste, how, how, how we're contacting suppliers for ingredients. Are yes, KP's writing this list, Mark, of actually, you know, things that he doesn't need to wash? And yeah, but there's that, there's that classic thing with KPs, isn't there? If you put a bit of tinfoil in the bottom of trays, how much that saves a kitchen porter from washing up it because, you know, things don't stick on the bottom of your tray. Yeah. It's Silly just, little things like that. Yeah, but yeah, the thing is, I think this is the thing is, what, what this has done has given us time to think. Now, what, what, how is Midsummer going to reopen? Midsummer's going to be... Uh, I'll be honest with you, I think I've never been this excited. I, I, yeah. I am absolutely buzzing by it. And, and I keep on walking around it. And it's, do you know, me and Mark have always spoken about this, is there's points when we've worked together where there's been a feeling. That feeling has been that we've been invincible. And it doesn't, it doesn't happen very often, but we both, it's just a twinkle in our eyes and it can be on a Saturday night service. And it really doesn't happen that much. I want that feeling from day one and I never want that to stop. <clears throat> now, if that means I need to give more to my staff and I need to give them more time, what this is going to give me the ability to be is it's going to give me the ability to, to work with everybody individually, to get them to have the same mindset as me, to understand where we're going, for Mark to manage a, a, a business with a, uh, a very, you know, let's look at it. If I do a 200 covers a week, it's going to make me X amount of money. If I do 220, it's going to make me that amount of money. I will be able to govern my costs because at the end of the day, it's my costs. You know, why is Midsummer House, you know, I'm, I'm investing 50, 60,000 pounds back into the business right now. Most people are sitting there worried about how that their future is. Yeah, absolutely. We're very stable because we own the property. We, uh, we, 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 you know, I don't live a champagne lifestyle. We, we both, uh, we both have very normal lives. We both, you know, go home and walk our dogs at the weekend and watch the same junk on the TV and, and cook very simply at home. And we both traveled a lot last year. Mark went to 11 Madison Park and per se, I went to Francine and Noma. And we've both taken a lot from them experiences, the good and the bad. Yeah. Because, you know, not every experience is, you know, Francine was mind blowing and Mark had an amazing time uh, per se. And you look back and these restaurants, it's all about luxury. So what is Midsummer House? Midsummer House is going to be a restaurant that's built around 20 years of experience. That's not taking any of the past into consideration. It's now taking the future into consideration. The generation, the way people eat has changed. Uh, my outlook has it's taken 20 years, but it has changed. And it's time to work with, you know, my restaurant manager, she started here two years ago as a hostess. Okay, zero restaurant experience. The difference between her and anybody else is she has got a passion to please people. So she looks at everything in a way of, would I want to be served that? How would I look at it? And you look at the way she works and me and Mark are learning from her. So realistically, they say old habits die hard, but the habit is going to be, this is a new Midsummer House. This is, we're very lucky. We've got an amazing shell to work with, but everything is changing and it's changing for the best. If it's not, if, 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 if it doesn't need to be done, it won't be done. But, the journey of everything that comes into this building, including the customers and the staff, is going to be a better experience. And that's what we're working for. Guys, I think that's a brilliant point to end it. Look, it's very exciting. 
Um, the hair's growing. That's the problem. Yeah, I need a haircut. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> the thing is, the interesting thing is... Sod all this <laughs> hope cuisine, right? We all need haircuts. <laughs> yeah, it's ridiculous, isn't it? <laughs> so, the interesting thing is, Mark, and this is the thing that worries me, is they say July, but I can't see it being July. And no, I think I, this is I, why I the furlong's the gone on. Is, to, is, is, the is furlong's been extended to October. And, you know, I think everyone needs to take their head out of the sand slightly and realise that, you know, we've got a massive future. You know, this is, this is a, a, a massive problem for the whole of the hospitality industry. But it is time to reflect on the past and look at the future because... Absolutely. We've still got a responsibility to, to train the best chefs in the country so people can live, you know, in years to come, they will look back at the memories of what, you know, I look back at people like Michel Roux and Nico Ladenis and Kaufman, and <coughs> they, they set the standards for this country. It's time to, you know, to, to move it forward. And you look at the top 50 list and you say to yourself, there's no UK restaurants in there anymore. Well, we need to we need to change that because we've got some amazing restaurants in this country, yeah, absolutely. and the best ones will survive. You know, you talk about Nathan, Sat, Claude, Tom. You know, they're going to open up and smash the shit out of this, and me and Mark are just trying to keep up. Well, look, guys, thank you very, very much. It's been fantastic to talk to you, Good Daniel. You. You're always honest. You know, brilliant, Mark. Congratulations, ten years. Deserves uh, a that, that deserves a carriage clock in itself. Be fair, it? It, I, it is losing <laughs> a little bit. The, the reason is, you know, if it, if it was shorter, it would be well gone. But Well done for keeping him on the straight and narrow. Yeah. And, and, and listen, good luck. You know, I hope, I you. hope you're open in July or, 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 or as soon as possible. I hope everybody's open in that, in that period of time. But thank you for your time. I know you've got to go back to blowtorch in the, um, the staircase. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's been great to talk to you both. And sorry about the technical difficulties, but right, thank right. you for your time. Take Cheers, care, guys. Mark. Cheers, Cheers, guys. Cheers, guys. We hope you enjoyed this interview. And if you have any comments, feel free to tweet us or comment on the post. Uh, we're making all of our interviews available to download. And finally, if you like what we do, whether it's our podcast or our videos or even our features, please head over to our Patreon page and support us there. This episode of Grilled is sponsored by Rationale, your leading provider in multifunctional hot food preparation equipment. Register now for a free Rationale live demo at www.rationale-online.com.